I'm Pete Woods, Harmony Ecologist with the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, and I'm going to talk to you about midsummer butterflies in Western Pennsylvania. I wanted to cover all the species that are flying right now, all the species that you might see if you went out butterflying in the next few weeks, but there are just too many of them. So instead, I'll be talking about the diversity of butterflies in Pennsylvania and their ecology while illustrating these topics with some species that are on the wing right now. And then I'll introduce you to a few more species just to round it out. So in Pennsylvania, there are 155 species of butterflies plus two additional subspecies. Now when I say butterflies, what I actually mean is butterflies and skippers. And butterflies are one super family of moths that is adapted to flying in the daytime. And there's another super family of moths that's adapted to flying in the day, and that's the skippers. And they look kind of similar, and most people just call them all butterflies, so I'm gonna lump them together and call them butterflies. Um, so of those 155 species, 10 are not here anymore. They're either definitely extirpated from Pennsylvania, or they're historic, which means they might be gone, but they could be hiding out somewhere. Maybe we can rediscover them. There are 33 species in Pennsylvania that we consider rare. And these are conservation targets for the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program, and we keep track of these as rare species. There are 15 additional watch list species. These are species that might be rare or they might be a little bit too common to be called rare. And if we get a little more data on them, we hope to be able to put them in one category or the other. There are also 35 non-resident species. You can find these in Pennsylvania, at least sometimes, but they don't live here year round. Finally, there are two introduced species of butterfly. One is the cabbage white, which you probably have in your backyard. And the other is uh, this one, the European skippers, one of our tiniest butterflies. And these, of course, were introduced from Europe. So the ecological roles of butterflies are all the ways they interact with other organisms and their environment. And this includes the things that they consume, the things that consume them, and other processes such as pollination. So when you think of a butterfly, you might picture it being on a flower. There's a symbiotic relationship between flowers and their pollinators. The plant provides nectar in exchange for the possibility of pollination. That is the hope that a butterfly or some other pollinator will accidentally pick up pollen from one flower and transfer it to another flower of the same species. Of course, butterflies aren't the only insects that provide pollination, but they're often the most noticeable because they're large and they're active in the daytime. Other pollinators include moths, flies, bees, and beetles. Butterflies are very well adapted to drinking nectar. Um, they have a proboscis, which is kind of like a hollow drinking straw. In this photo, this skipper has its proboscis uncurled and inserted into a swamp milkweed flower. So this is the only way that adult butterflies um, get nutrition. They don't have any chewing mouth parts as they did when they were caterpillars. Most caterpillars are herbivores. And on the right is a pipe vine swallowtail. And that yellow thing on its head is called an osmeterium. It's, a, it's an anti-predator defense. And it emits foul-smelling chemicals that um, are supposed to deter a predator from eating. The pipe vine swallowtail, like many caterpillar species, is a specialist. That is, it only eats a few species of plants. In this case, it's a pipe vine plant. The caterpillar on the left is actually not a caterpillar. It's the larva of a sawfly. So as larvae, most sawflies are very much like caterpillars and are easy to mistake for caterpillars. But they're actually related to wasps. And as adults, they look a bit like a wasp and they are predators on other insects. Uh, of course, butterflies, when they're adults, are not predators. Um, but some caterpillars are carnivores. Uh, we have two carnivorous caterpillars 
in Pennsylvania. One is the harvester. That's the adult on the lower right and the caterpillar on the lower left. The top photo is woolly alder aphids. This aphid and several other species of aphids are what this caterpillar eats. Harvesters have a shorter life cycle than any other butterfly in this region, going from an egg to an adult in just 21 days. So they can pack in five or more generations into one year. And that's because of the high protein content of their diet. Our other carnivorous caterpillar eats these. Anyone who spends a lot of time looking at cherry leaves will eventually notice these black cherry leaf galls. Inside, these galls are packed with dozens of tiny little mites, and these are the main food of the cherry gall azure. And I don't have a photo of those caterpillars, but this is a closely related summer azure, and it's eating flower buds from a horse ball plant. It doesn't eat the whole bud. You can see the hole it left on the flower bud on the right side of the photo. After it makes that hole, it reaches inside and eats out the internal parts, including the protein-rich developing pollen. So it's not a big stretch for a caterpillar to go from eating the high-protein bits inside a flower bud to eating the high-protein bits inside uh, an insect gall. When an azure caterpillar finishes uh, eating its buds or mites and it's gotten to full size, it will pupate until the next spring and then the cycle will start all over again. Unless, of course, it gets eaten by something. Various animals love to eat caterpillars and butterflies. Birds are one of the main predators of caterpillars, but um, other vertebrates and invertebrates also take their share. Crab spiders, like the one on the right, are ambush predators, and flowers are one of their favorite places to hide and wait for prey, and they're very well camouflaged hiding among the flowers. So with heavy predation rates, butterflies and caterpillars have evolved a number of anti-predator defenses. Um, and one of them is spines like this. This is actually a moth caterpillar. It's a buck moth, which is a rare species in Pennsylvania, and it lives in scrub oak barrens. And these spines are why you shouldn't try to pick up a buck moth caterpillar. This defense works very well against larger predators like birds but it doesn't work very well against tinier enemies. And you can see two small white oval eggs stuck on this caterpillar. These are the eggs of a tachinid fly. And when they hatch, the fly larvae will burrow into the caterpillar and eat it from the inside. And this caterpillar isn't going to survive. Parasites and parasitoids like this can be a major source of mortality for caterpillars. Uh, now I'd like to introduce you to a couple other um, butterflies that are on the wing right now. This is the Baltimore checker spot, often called just Baltimore. This species is considered rare in Pennsylvania. This is white turtlehead, the primary host plant for Baltimores. And at least in western Pennsylvania, all Baltimores, when they're young caterpillars, start on white turtlehead. This photo was taken at Lowville Fen, which is a WPC property in Erie County. These are Baltimore eggs on the underside of a turtle head leaf. Now something else came along and was eating this leaf, and I think it was after the eggs were laid. Um, it might have been a turtle head sawfly larva, but whatever it was ate around the eggs because they're protected by chemical defenses. All life stages of the Baltimore have aposomatic coloration which means that it's a, it's a bright color that warns predators that Baltimores are distasteful or toxic. And if you get really close up here, you can see the barrel shape of each egg, and the eggs are stacked two, sometimes even three eggs high. If you've ever watched a monarch butterfly laying eggs, it lays one egg on one plant and then flies to a different plant to lay another egg. And this probably helps the caterpillars to not compete with each other, but Baltimores um, stick together. They live colonially, and even after they hatch, they stay close together, sharing a, a silk nest on one turtle head plant. And after they've grown up together that first summer, they overwinter as caterpillars. And when they come out in the spring, they emerge, and each one goes on its own way. 
And if they can find turtle head, they'll eat turtle head, but they'll also eat a wide variety of other plants. They start as specialists and then become generalists. So after they get nice and fat eating whatever plant they find, they pupate for a few weeks and then they emerge as an adult. Butterfly watchers know Baltimore's as a species that might be found in the same place for a few years, but then it'll disappear and it may be gone for many years before it comes back. And we think this is because they deplete patches of turtle head. The caterpillars just eat them down until there's nothing left. And then that population will have to disperse and go elsewhere. And eventually uh, the turtle head will recover and then eventually a Baltimore will find it and come along and recolonize that patch. Now, even if you haven't seen the other butterflies that I showed you today, I guarantee you've seen a red admiral. They're boldly colored on the dorsal surface of the wings. They have these uh, bright orange stripes on a dark background. And on the underside, they're very camouflaged, so it can stay hidden from predators by closing its wings, and it just looks like a leaf. Do you see a, a smiley face on this caterpillar? If we zoom in, you can see that the smile is actually the proboscis, and it's curled up. And then you can only see about half of that, of, of the curl, because um, the rest of it is covered up by that white thing that looks kind of like a snout, but those are actually maxillary palps, which are a pair of finger-like sensory appendages. So red admirals usually arrive in Pennsylvania in May, and they look for the right plant to lay an egg on, such as this stinging nettle. See that curled up leaf there? If we unroll that, we will find a red admiral caterpillar. And in case you were wondering, yes, it was painful to get this photo, that was 10 hours ago and my fingers are still tingling. So red admirals can use sting nettle as a host or they can use wood nettle as a host. Wood nettle also stings. Uh, most people have very strong feelings about these plants and so do I. I love them. Wood nettles especially because they host so many different species of animals. And maybe next year I'll give you a talk about all the things that live on nettles and burrs and briars and all those plants that Pittsburghers call jagger bushes. Uh, but for right now, I'll just show you one of them. This is, in my opinion, the most beautiful gall produced by an insect. It's only found on wood nettles. These green translucent baubles are produced by the wood nettle plant <clears throat> in response to the hormones produced by the larva of a fly that lives inside them. This species of fly was undescribed, unknown to science until just four years ago. Okay, back to butterflies, red admirals. So some species of butterfly overwinter as eggs, some overwinter as caterpillars, some as pupae, some as adults. <clears throat> red admirals, in Pennsylvania at least, do none of the above. They make several generations between May and October and they can build up to quite large numbers and then when it gets cold they all just die. And, um, and so those butterflies are just, they were just a dead end and they have to be recolonized from other red admirals um, from down south the next spring. And why do they do this every year? I don't really know, but somehow this strategy of spreading out across the continent works for red admirals. And someday it'll be warm enough for them to overwinter here in Pennsylvania. And we just have to trust that they know what they're doing. Okay, I hope I've inspired you to go out and look for butterflies. Look in your backyard, look in your neighborhood park, visit a WPC property and see what you can find there. <coughs> In addition to binoculars and a camera, you might want to bring along a field guide. If you get just one field guide, get Butterflies of Pennsylvania by Jim Monroe and David Wright. It came out a couple years ago. It covers every species you might find in Pennsylvania. But if you get two butterfly books, consider getting Butterflies of the East Coast by Czech and Tudor. It's a larger book. 
It covers additional species and has a longer entry for each one. But if you just want to know more about carnivorous caterpillars, um, try Caterpillars of Eastern North America by David Wagner. It's a really good book. Okay, thank you for coming to Members Day. I will leave you with this photo of one of our more understated butterflies, an Appalachian brown.